Good morning, good morning, good morning. Hey, everybody. A, a full house, that's awesome. Welcome to, uh, welcome to the next in our series of the truth of Renew Big Canoe. There's, um, there's a lot of different information sources in Big Canoe. Some of them are accurate. Many of them are not. Um, so we thought we would do it this way and let you actually hear from Bill Thurber, who is the uh, illustrious, talented, and gifted, all of the above, uh, head of our finance committee. And it's been a pleasure to work with Bill over the last couple years. Yeah, that same Bill Thurber is the one I got. <laughs> so I'm talking about that guy right there. You're waiting for someone else to come in. No, that's Bill. So. <laughs> No, really. Uh, Bill has been uh, an awesome partner in this going back, honestly, two years ago is how long we started to talk about this. So we asked him to go through a little bit of Finance 101 uh, for Big Canoe because you need to understand that first and then uh, segue into how that impacts Renew Big Canoe. So, Bill. And then I'll take questions afterwards. Um, Bill is handling, of course, anything financial. But if you guys have any questions on anything else about uh, Renew Big Canoe, uh, we'll be happy to answer them after the after Bill's done. Thanks. Everybody here okay? Perfect. All right. So welcome, everybody. This is um, intimidating for me, honestly. <laughs> um, I am not nearly as eloquent a speaker as some other folks you hear from time to time, Scott included, but I will uh, try to plod through this in a way that hopefully keeps you somewhat engaged and lets you think about questions you might have at the end. And like Scott said, there's a lot going on on Facebook these days about different aspects of Renew Big Canoe. Um, some of it may be true, some of it, and a lot of it may not. Um, although I've heard that everything on Facebook must be true, right? <laughs> um, but anyway, I just want to thank you all for coming out. I see some members of the Finance Committee here as well. I won't mention them by name today, but thank you for coming out to support. So we, like Scott said, we're going to go through a couple of what I call Big Canoe basics first, um, just to kind of lay out some things that um, I think are important for people who maybe haven't been here that long, or maybe if you've been here that long and you don't, you don't know. So let's uh, start. So what's Big Canoe? We are a 501c4 organization. What does that mean? That means we are a not-for-profit and I'm going to read a couple of definitions as we start because I think it's important just to hear it the way that it's defined. So a 501c4 is an organization that must not be organized for profit and must be operated exclusively to promote social welfare. So what does that mean? I mean, it means we're a mission-based organization. We're not a profit-motivated organization. There's a lot that gets said out there about why aren't we profitable? That's not the way this organization is set up. So I think it's important to understand that. But we also operate a business here. I mean, we operate amenities, golf, a clubhouse, various other things. And that generates what's called unrelated business income. So what does that mean? Well, let's read that one. It says it's income from a trade or business regularly carried on that is not substantially related to the charitable, educational, or other purpose that is the basis of the organization's exemption, meaning the exemption from tax. So what does that mean? I mean, it means that uh, if we generate income from things like our clubhouse and our golf courses and all of that, it could potentially be subject to tax. One of the reasons we generate losses is because we have a huge base of fixed assets here. We have buildings, roads, dams, golf courses, and they generate depreciation expense. They get written off over time. And so that's what helps to generate a loss. And so therefore, we don't pay tax on any of that. We're cash focused. I mean, there's an old saying that I learned way back, and I got the gray to prove it. Way back in my career, three words, cash is king. And we in the finance committee and Scott in management we look at cash. We look at how much cash does this organization generate to help us do the things um, that we need to do. All right, so how do we do? We are very strong financially. Um, I don't know how many of you actually go to the website and look at our financials every month, but if you do, um, there's a key metric that we look at called income before 
depreciation. So that's after all cash expenses, including interest on our loans, and that is what we call cash flow. So if you look over the last six years, we have historically generated more than $4 million annually. And we're going to go into that in a little bit, but I just wanted to highlight that uh, at the front end of this. I mean, we generate very good cash flows from running our business, shall we say. Um, we have $52 million in assets, and this is all based on our audited financial statements at um, December 31st of 2022. 95% um, of those assets are in two key areas, our fixed assets, right? So our buildings, our dams, our roads, our clubhouse, et cetera, um, and our cash. 78% of our assets are in those fixed assets, and about 17 to 18% uh, is in cash. And we have property owner equity. That's our ownership position, if you will, in this organization of $44 million at 1231 of 22. Very impressive. Um, you know, it's a, I would say that strong owner equity equals a very strong financial position. Um, we are very attractive to lenders, and we'll talk about that when we get further on into this. Um, but we've had lenders tell us that um, we are in a very enviable position when you look at other organizations like us, um, and, and so we should be very proud of that. Okay. We have clean audits. Um, what does that mean? So last definition that I'm going to read. What is independent? So we're audited by what a reputable independent accounting firm every year. Um, so what does independence mean for those who are not CPAs in the room? Independence of mind is the state of mind that permits a member, meaning a member of the AICPA, the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, to perform what they call an attest service, which is like an audit, uh, without being affected by influences that compromise professional judgment, thereby allowing an individual to act with integrity and exercise objectivity and professional skepticism. That's a long definition. Um, what it means is they're independent. They come on site, they ask for a lot of things, Jane Hagen and her team provide those things and then they independently verify and come up with an audit opinion. We have what's called an unmodified uh, audit opinion, which is about the strongest opinion you can have from an independent accounting firm. It's important because, you know, there are some out there who would perhaps say, oh, the POA, they have the auditors in their back pocket. I think nothing could be further from the truth. So I just thought it was important to go over that. So what do they audit when they come on site? Well, 95% of our assets, as I said, are in cash and fixed assets. So, you know, they obviously spend a great deal of emphasis on those key areas in addition to their normal audit scope. But some examples would be third-party verification of all of our cash accounts and review of our bank reconciliations. Um, they they uh, go through our, our fixed asset register as we add assets during the year and verify those purchases or those conversions of construction projects into assets. And lastly, uh, as an example, they actually independently calculate our depreciation expense so that they can confirm or not confirm that management's calculation of depreciation uh, was appropriate. So, those are just things that I think it's important for all of us as property owners to know that this is a big time organization. We have, we have checks, balances, policies, we have audits. You know, so when I stand up here as the chair of the finance committee and say we're in a strong financial position, I can say so with a high level of confidence based on what management has done and based on what our independent accountants have confirmed. So just felt it was important. So why are we here today, now that we got through with the boring stuff? This is a pretty neat little slide that Scott and I kind of came up with. And, and it's meant to illustrate how do we get money into the organization and what do we do with it once we have it? Okay, so we really, what you see here is kind of three major sources of cash into the organization. 
There's actually a fourth cash account that's not illustrated here. If you look on our balance sheet, it's called our capital reserve fund. It's restricted, has about $3 million in it. It's not illustrated here because we, and when I say we, we mean the finance committee and the board, consider that account to be an emergency account. It has provisions in it where we can draw and use it, but they're pretty restrictive. I mean, if we take money from that fund to repair a road, uh, you know, a major road, or if something were to happen with one of the dams, it has to be repaid within three years. And so we kind of view that fund as it's rainy day, it's over here. So that's why it's not on this uh, chart. So what you see here is three things, and I'll start with the one that says capital, I'm sorry, the one that says operating assessments right here. So what is that? You guys get a bill every month. It's got, I don't know, 300 and some odd dollars, I think. Um, and that goes to pay for things in our organization. It pays payroll, it pays for running the amenities, it pays for maintenance and landscaping and our interest expense on our loans. So that's one source of cash. We also have at the top there called capital assessments. You also see that on your bill every month. That generates about 1.8 million a year uh, into our cash position uh, for things that like normal capital uh, replacement items. And then the third thing here is the capital contribution fee that was put in place a number of years back. It's currently at 3,500. It can go to 5,000 with a $500 uh, annual adjustment. Right now that generates uh, about seven to 800,000. And this view here, I should have said this at the front, this is kind of our current and projected view, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So this is not a static point in time of this is what it was in 2022. This is kind of a current plus longer term view of our cash flows. So when you put all those things together, 4.2 million of income from depreciation, uh, before depreciation, 1.8 million from capital assessments, and about 900,000 from our CCF, we have 6.9 million or nearly 7 million in annual cash available to the business every single year. That's pretty good, <laughs> I think. So what do we do with it, okay? The very first thing we do with it is we say, well, do we have principal to pay on our debt? And we do. Um, we, we'll get into it a little bit later, but right now our principal payments on our, on our loan, plus we have a, a financing agreement on the new fire truck that we bought, they average about 1.1 million a year. So that comes off the top, if you will, and it really comes from operations. I mean, these things are aggregated into a cash bucket, but if you really look at it, the debt service, the principal on the debt, is funded through that $4.2 million of operating cash. And then, so you net everything down, you take 1.1 million away from the 6.9, and you have almost $6 million of free cash, if you will, um, that is for our normal capital needs, okay? What are our normal capital needs? Roads. We spend at least a million dollars a year maintaining our roads, bridges, dams, buildings, those kind of things. And, you know, just as an example, well, let me say this first. So management, as part of the budget cycle every year, does a capital budget, but it's not a one-year capital budget. It is a one-year capital budget plus a refresh, if you will, if that's the right term, of a 10-year capital plan. So we're, they're looking out into the future and saying, okay, what are our near-term priorities for capital? And then ongoing, over a 10-year period, what are our capital needs? And that flows into a model that Jane and management look at and with the finance committee on a regular basis that has a 10-year cash flow. And we look at that, as I said, frequently so that we can measure, are there years in which we feel uncomfortable about capital? Are there things that we should accelerate and move forward? Are there things that perhaps that we should push out a bit so that we manage our cash to a point where we can meet our capital needs and also have sufficient um, cash in the, in, in the uh, operation. So an example of that is, you know, there's a lot of noise that gets made about the Pettit Dam. Who's heard of the Pettit Dam before? <laughs> um, so in the 10-year capital model, over the next five years, there's $6.5 million slotted for 
uh, work on the Pettit Dam. 6.3 million of that is over the next three years, 23, 24, and 25. So when the question gets asked, you know, well, what about the Pettit Dam? Where's that money coming from? This is where that money is coming from, from the normal operations of our business here um, at Big Canoe. Okay, so how do we pay for this thing called Renew Big Canoe? You guys have heard of that, I'm sure. So in the little article I wrote for the uh, smoke signals, you know, I kind of gave you the scenario. So it was summer of 2021. I was a member of the finance committee then. I came on board, I think, in August or September of 20. Um, Bob White at the time was the chair of the committee, and we were having a finance committee meeting, and we were all sitting there saying, interest rates are at levels that we've never seen before. You know, in, not in my lifetime anyway. Um, you know, very, very historically low interest rates. And we were noodling on that, and we said, we should, we should go out and look for some money, you know? There are projects here in Big Canoe where we could use long-term, low-interest financing to accomplish. And so, with the concurrence of the board at that time, we set uh, into action with a subcommittee that uh, I headed up, and Gene Morgia, who's in the front here, was a key member of, and then Candace Robertson, who was a board member back then, and Jane Hagen, our director of finance, and we said, let's go see what we can do. And, and the idea was that we said, we want to be able to draw money over a period of time as we need it, and then at the end of that period, we would like to convert that to a long-term loan, a mortgage, if you will, um, for a 15-year period. And we, want, we don't want interest rates that will be three years from now, because we don't know what they will be, and we think they will be higher. We want to lock in today's interest rates three years down the road. And people looked at us and said, well, you won't be able to do that. <laughs> no bank will do that for you. And so, you know, our strong financial foundation allowed us to competitively bid with, I think, six or seven banks, all of which were clamoring to lend us money, quite frankly. They were very interested in our business model. They loved our asset base. I mean, when you look at, a, if you're a lender, one of the things you love about a client is when they have tangible stuff that, that you know, you can look to, right? Buildings, golf courses, and things like that, and lots of cash. And so we had banks that were very interested in doing business with us. Uh, Wells Fargo um, had the existing loan. I mean, those of you who've been around for a while, and we'll talk about it in a little bit, but there was a loan that was put in place in 2016 uh, for the land deal and some other things, about 10 and a half million. Um, Wells Fargo did that deal, and they liked that deal, and they didn't want to lose that deal. And so they came up with a structure that worked for us. So what's that structure? It was a $15 million credit facility allowing us to draw money over three years, starting in May of 2022 when we closed the deal. And in May of 2025, anything that's outstanding on that converts. What do I mean by that? It converts to a 15-year fixed rate loan that amortizes uh, everybody know what amortizing is? Basically pay the principal equally over 15 years um, at 3.46%. We like that deal. <laughs> um, and so we put that in place and we took it to the board. The board liked that deal as well. And, and the board felt, and the key here is, so, it's, so it's, it, the, re, the interest rate floats for three years. That, that's, if there's a downside, that's the downside. Okay, and we looked at it and we looked at what we thought the Federal Reserve was going to do with interest rates. We thought they were gonna raise interest rates. We didn't think they were gonna get on a racetrack <laughs> to raise interest rates, which they did. I mean, so in, in all honesty, we're paying more now than we thought we were gonna be paying. Uh, but when we did the 23 budget with management, we looked at a rate forecast and it basically said rates are gonna continue to rise until about mid-2023, which is kind of where we are. Um, there's still some, some talk that they'll raise again a little bit, 
But effectively, then they thought that ra rates would pause for a period of time and then actually begin to come down again. And so we built that in, looked at the differences, and the board felt that that trade-off of paying a floating rate for a period of time on the existing debt was worthwhile so that in, t in May of 2025, we would have 3.46% money for 15 years. We thought it was a prudent decision. So when you look at the projects that are on this slide, you know, they add up to, I think, slightly more than, than 14 million, somewhere in that range. So, so how do we get there? I mean, we've been paying principal on, this, on the new loan since we closed it. We don't have to pay principal. When we put the deal, the new deal in place with Wells Fargo, um, they said you can be interest only over that three-year period if you would like to be. And we thought about that for a little while, and then we thought that the prudent thing to do um, from a property owner perspective and the board's perspective was, no, let's continue to pay principal at the same rate that we were paying it on the old loan so that we can continue to pay that down and then maximize our ability to draw um, uh, if and when we got into Renew Big Canoe. So that's, that's in a nutshell how we pay for the projects that are included in Renew Big Canoe. Can we, um, can we maybe hold the questions until, this is the last slide. <laughs> so if you just let me get through that, then we'll take all the questions you want. So where are we and where were we? And that's what this slide is meant to show. As I said, in 2016, there was a $10.5 million loan for a land purchase that was put in place at a fixed rate of 3.29%. The monthly principal and interest on that loan was 103,000 and change uh, at the time. And now, you know, th wh what I call the Renew Big Canoe Loan now, um, as I said, has a three-year draw period at a floating rate. We're continuing to pay principal uh, down uh, as we would have if we kept the old loan. Um, it was about, I think what we paid off was, uh, Jane, remind, 4.8 million, I think, yeah, uh, is what we paid off. And, and at the end of the three-year period, this loan converts to a fixed rate at 3.46%. And the principal and interest on this loan is 106938 starting in May of 2025. So where did the $2 per property owner per month come from? This is where it comes from. If we had left the old loan the way that it was, that's what we would be continuing to pay, 103, 101. If we, you know, now that we're doing this new loan in May, assuming we've drawn all of it, It'll be 106938 or about $4,000 a month more in principle than what the old loan was. Now, in reality, since we're paying a floating rate now, our payment will actually go down when we convert because we're paying a higher interest rate than 3.46 now. But this comparison was just that was then, this is now. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, when you look at our capital requirements, and the, I mentioned we have a 10-year capital model, they tend to trail off a bit after about 2026, and that's largely because the, the, the large expenditures for Pettit Dam will be behind us, and we'll kind of get to a more quote-unquote normal capital cycle. Um, so there is some potential, and I, I wouldn't want to commit to it, but there is some potential that as that happens, we could actually accelerate uh, the pay down of this new loan if, if we felt like that was a prudent use of the cash at that point in time. Um, but that's the magic of the $2 a month, <laughs> if there is. And that's the last slide. So um, I don't know how you want to do questions, Scott. Somebody bring her a mic maybe. Or Okay, so I'm going to bring the mic to you. You can stand up because the, uh, the, the crowd on the video can't hear you uh, without the mic. And just tell your name and uh, your 
property number. Okay, so I'm coming to you. Okay, that's just the way we always do it, but that's okay if you want to be that. Okay, I will. So I'm having trouble understanding how these two loans relate. Maybe it's just me, I don't, I, but I don't understand. So if you can make it really simple for somebody that didn't do well in math. Okay, how they. How, how do they relate? Are they individuals? Are, you, right. You've talked okay. about conversion, so you've talked about multiple things. So how, how do they stand individually and how do they relate together? Okay, so the loan on the left was taken out in 2016, okay? And so, so, right, so that loan does not exist anymore, okay? Right, okay, so that loan is gone, and so, well, so when we closed on this new loan in May of 2022, the one on the right, Okay, what I mentioned was that it, it gave us the ability to draw funds over three years. Okay, so it's, we started at zero when we closed. Okay, zero outstanding. And the very first thing we did, let me finish, the very first thing we did was we said, we're going to pay off that loan, the one on the left. Exactly, we, we took an advance on the, on the new loan to pay off the old loan. And then what we said was, well, Wells Fargo says we can be interest only if we want to be on that new loan. And we said, no, we don't want to be interest only. We want to keep paying principal as if. <laughs> Is this still working? Okay. Sorry about that. Let me just, let me just, let me just hold it. So, um, now I lost my train of thought. Um, oh, so we continue to pay principal on that new loan as on the same basis as the old loan. So basically it was like a refinancing, if, if that's a term that makes sense to you. So right now, so, so okay, so hang on. So right now, so the number that says 106938, that number is actually higher than 106938 right now because we are paying a floating interest rate. Okay. Okay. So that interest rate now is somewhere around 6.5%. Okay. So we're paying more now. But as I said earlier, the trade off is that in May of 25, we revert to 3.46%. Well, let me make, did that answer your question? I can't hear you up here, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, she's already asked one, so we're gonna move on now to this lady right next to her. Well, we can't, we can't have everybody ask 20 questions. I apologize for that. So we, we paid off So the your old, name is Cheryl I'm Dunlap. I'm sorry, I Cheryl know Dunlap, that. yes. <laughs> How much did we pay off when we refinanced? About 4.8 million. So we really only have, of that 15 million right now, about little over 10 available. That's absolutely correct. And but yet the Renew Big Canoe is a right at 15 million. So is it the plan to pay off that entire 4.8 that we refinanced so, so that we have the 15 million available for the, all the re Big Canoe, Renew that's a Big great, Canoe that's projects? A, that's a great question. So, so like I said, we could be interest only, but we're not. We're continuing to pay principal. And the idea, and you know, think of it graphically, right? So we're paying down here, and under the assumption that these projects get a yes vote, we're gonna start drawing money to pay for them. And so as they equate over time, I think the number right now is we should have a little over 14 million of actual kind of new money available to us, if that makes sense to you. But, So, so the draw period, right, is over a three-year period. So as we start doing these projects, we're going to start drawing money to pay for them. But we're continuing to pay on the, you know, at the existing 
uh, amortization schedule from the old loan. So that's the balance is coming down as then the balance is coming up. So ultimately we will have the full $15 million available and borrowed. All right, we got one back here. Uh, Victor Hernandez. I'm a little worried about the sequence, sequence of events here. We're gonna draw the full 15 million over three years, mm -hmm. but the projects are gonna take more than three years to complete. You want and what order are we going to be doing these projects so that we make sure that uh, we don't paint ourselves into a corner that we can't get out of? Yeah, my understanding, and I'm not the operational or construction expert, but my understanding is that the Renew Big Canoe projects are slated in the 2024 and five time frame, essentially. Yeah. Um, so the idea is that they would be completed as we reach the full drawdown on the loan. We got one here. We got one somewhere else. You have a question? All right, Stacy Johnson. Um, so, 4.8 of the new loan was used to pay off the land purchase loan. Correct. But currently, that loan is being paid back at 6.5 percent, right? At the variable that's, rate. That's correct. The numbers you have up there on the left show us what we were paying at the th original 3.29 percent. Mm -hmm. So, when you're doing you're trying to show an apples to apples, you've kind of, what's that missing step? What are we actually paying on the 4.8 at the 6.5%? So it's two things, okay? We are paying principal at exactly the same rate that we would have if that loan still existed. So we didn't change that at all. I mean, Jane Hagen has an amortization schedule from the old loan and we pay that amount every month. It's somewhere between 90, and 100,000 a month. And then the only difference is that the interest rate is floating as opposed to um, fixed. Um, and that, I don't have that number like in, embedded in my, in, say again? Yeah, so let me put it to you this way. So I looked at it um, with Jane uh, a bit ago and, and we went back and said, okay, what, what was our assumption with the rate forecast in the, um, in the 23 budget. And we looked at, okay, if we had left the old loan in place, we would have paid a certain amount of interest until the payoff. And now that we're floating, we're paying a different amount of interest. That difference between 23 until 25 when it goes to fixed was about a total of $150,000. So if you wanted to just average it, it's 50,000 a year more it doesn't work out quite that way because the rates are not linear, but that's one way to look at it. Good morning, Regis Falinski. I live on Falcon Heights. Um, I can understand the property owner confusion over this slide and the $4,000 a month. I hope between now and August, there's a way to make that clear. Um, but anyway, my question doesn't have to do with that. Uh, clearly, and Bill, thank you for your presentation. We do, uh, we are in a very strong financial position. We do have money, we have access to money. But because of that, I don't think that's any reason we should, we should not spend money prudently. And I would like to talk about one, or ask about one specific project being the post office. It's proposed that we spend $2.7 million on a postal facility. Plugging that number into the loan amortization table, we will be paying about $800,000 in interest on that $2.7 million over the 15-year term of the loan. So that postal facility is gonna cost the property owners $3.5 million when all is said and done. Now my question is this, it's a postal facility. It's not an amenity. It's not gonna do anything to help property owner values. Nobody's gonna buy in Big Canoe because we have this gee whiz postal facility. So, 
did we look at how we could correct the deficiencies, which as uh, Scott pointed out in his presentation, they are basically, we need about 30 more boxes or 50 more boxes and improve the parking. Did we look at a way we could do that in a more financially responsible, prudent manner than spending three and a half million dollars? I'm gonna see if anybody else and I'll circle back to you. So Regis, I think you know most of the answer to that question. So the um, Long Range Planning Committee spent probably more time on that topic than any other topic. And the biggest issues with the existing post office are the topography of the land, which is pretty difficult to fix. We don't really have any flat parking in that area. Um, when I first got here, I think it was my first week, I looked at plans for how we might make the uh, postal parking better, safer, et cetera because once you start disturbing asphalt, you're into having to build retention ponds. The only place to put a retention pond was on that huge slope going down from the post office down to the uh, fire station. In 2020 dollars, it was a million dollars to do just the parking. So, and that didn't address the problems with capacity, that didn't address, you know, the, the other issues with a very old building similar to the racket club. So if you look at the 2.7 million that's up there for uh, the last, the previous slide for the post office, almost, um, almost 800,000 of that is in today's dollars dealing with improvements to the lower parking lot in front of the package porch. Um, we also get the advantage in this plan, obviously, of tying the post office in with the package porch. So it's a one-stop shop, it's flat, it's level, it's the safest parking we can figure out in, in uh, Big Canoe, quite honestly. Um, so if, we've, uh, if, if we, we're property owners, right? If we all decide to vote no on the post office, we will still have to spend money because we can't leave the post office the way it is. We will still have to spend that million dollars plus whatever um, it's going to be in today's dollars to redo all that parking, that hill, that retention pond, all that stuff. We'll still have to remodel some of the post office um, to add capacity, pull out bigger boxes, put in smaller boxes. There may be structural problems associated with that. I was looking at the building on Sunday when I was picking up my mail, and a lot of that T111 siding that wraps that building is starting to rot badly. So d the question is, do we want to keep throwing you know, good money after bad on a building that's already been expanded three times that's never really going to have what I think we deserve as far as safety and access and connectivity with the package porch? Or do we want to, you know, do a, a first class facility for Big Canoe? That's why the board put it up to a vote. There, there's always going to be multiple options here. Um, we just need to decide as a community if we want to keep kicking the can down the road on the post office and patching it, or do we want to step back and, and fix the problem, so. Man, do we got a lot of questions. We got questions all over the place here. Okay, I think this guy is first. I'm going to try and swing him around. We've got a lot of questions. Tell us your name. Neil Cornelson, lot 2992, if I recall correctly. Real simple. In, in 2025, we get all this approved. We pay down the 4.8. We get all this done. Our monthly assessment goes up approximately, what, $25 a month because of this loan? Okay, ask away, you're right here. <coughs> Michelle Toops, lot 8106. I'm gonna kind of shift and talk a little bit about the clubhouse. Will you address 
the parking and any future phases for the building. Can you hear me? And uh, uh, let me give you a little more information. I've talked to three POA folks, and one answer on the potential to expand parking is 50 spaces, the other was 100 spaces, and my third answer from Ask the POA was we're not even thinking about parking, we have nothing more than a conceptual plan out there. So I'm, I'm wondering if we're kind of building it and hoping they will come, and then we'll address parking if we're successful. If they do come and we haven't addressed parking, we may be creating a major irritant. So can you just kind of talk all about that? Yeah, totally. Believe it or not, all three of those answers are right. <laughs> it's good when that happens, isn't it? So. Um, Again, Long Range Planning Committee spent a lot of time with a bunch of civil engineers. We, we do have two different phases of parking plans to deal with increased demand that we hope will come in the future with the clubhouse renovation. And when I say hope, uh, the idea, right, is we're moving all, there's a lot of confusion about this too. We're taking all the capacity for dining from that side of the building, so the patio, the bar, the veranda, and bringing all that capacity over here. So no additional dining capacity, no additional staff, no additional kitchen help, no additional servers. It's just a better experience, better connectivity to the outdoors, better flow, bigger bar that we all say, you know, we desperately need from the pictures that I showed a few weeks ago, um, better seating, better operations because you're not crossing traffic constantly at that little hostess stand, better, better, better. Where the capacity increases is the meeting space capacity on the veranda. So we basically take what was in here, which as you can see is a pretty small room, it's kind of chopped up, and put that now on a veranda that's four season, twice as big as it is now, has great audiovisual, great acoustics, and so we're thinking of that place as becoming acoustic showcase, ridge runners, property owner weddings and events. If the board someday, after Scott retires, decides to open up property owner weddings again, then we would need a, a lot more capacity for parking. So phase one of parking for the clubhouse is 50 spaces. So we've done multiple layouts out there by changing around the islands, changing around um, the way the spaces are done. We can get about 50 out there without doing major, major damage. Phase two, would be change the entire entrance of the clubhouse. So the way the Choctaw Pass works, we, it, we would realign all that, that changes the golf complex out there, changes where the tees go for, for Choctaw One, and basically you come directly into the clubhouse now rather than coming inside where our, our uh, garbage trucks and all that goes. That's a much bigger project, and that would get us the additional spaces that you were talking about. So the way the board looked at this is, let's fix the property owner experience first, let's fix the employee issues we have with flow and visibility and operational issues, let's give property owners a good place for events and, and meetings and those type of things on the veranda, and then as we build capacity, or if we decide to start doing more and more and more outside events or whatever, we'll, we'll go with the 50 space parking plan first. If we go even bigger than that, five, six, seven years from now, we do have another plan to go even bigger if we need to. But crawl, walk, run. We don't need to spend a whole bunch of money on the hope that later on we're gonna need it. So we do have a plan, it is staged. Okay, I'm right. I'm right here, and this lady's right here. <laughs> Ruth Hall. Uh, what number are we? Four, four. Just, just your name. Yeah. Ruth Hall. Uh, I want to know who owns the post office. It does tell me the United States Postal Service. They are in the business of delivering the mail. They don't steal. Post yeah. So, so, so we own the building. We're responsible for maintaining the building and things of that nature. The, the post office operates that under a contract that goes back to 1970 something or other with Big Canoe that basically says it is not an official post office. 
That's why you don't get all the full postal services there. It is a mail delivery center. But they still pay you to use that building. No, they do not. No. There is no money that flows between us and the USPS. Yep. And a, as a result, operationally, they control what happens in that building. We do not. So, you know, I have many conversations with Michael Jordan, the postmaster, especially when we built the package porch, on how that was going to work, the slips in the boxes, getting rid of the slips, you know, what they do with packages, all of that. But we, we can influence it through our relationship with Michael, but we don't control it. Okay, I'm going to, I'm coming to you, sir. And the reason that we have to have this mic for all of these questions, by the way, is so that the viewers that will viewing this later on video will be able to hear your question. So just have patience, uh, be succinct, and uh, Mr. Goldstein. Paul Goldstein, lot number 2231. Uh, question for the um, postal facility question. Um, over the 15 year, we've been paying that, paying that down, what is the assumption about the capacity of the post office? Will it, will it fulfill our needs 15 years after it's completed? You know, we'll have enough P.O. boxes and what have you, space for all the projected community. Great question, Paul. So um, the first thing the Long Range Planning Committee did was to try to do their best guess based on uh, current construction trends at Big Canoe, 30 new houses a year, et cetera. An educated guess on what the developer might do on their extra uh, 1,400 units that they can build here. And basically, it gives us 20% additional capacity over what we have now, which long range planning believes will get us through the next 10 years. Then we had conversations with Michael Jordan, brought him over here. He brought up two people from Atlanta who control a lot of route delivery. And they basically said beyond that, any new areas the developer might build would be kiosk based. So if you go next door, for example, to the village of Blackwell Creek, they have drive up mailboxes, a kiosk, and that is the direction the Postal Service is going. I think, quite frankly, today, if we were building Big Canoe from scratch, we would not have a central mail facility. We would have kiosks located, you know, in each neighborhood, and it would be uh, far less convenient to get our mail than it is now. Um, but that, that's the answer. So 20% in the post office that, that we're going to build, and then eventually kiosks from there. Paul, Paul, I'll circle back to you. There's a lot of people out here. And by the way, there's a lot of uh, frequently asked questions on the website about this subject, including k about kiosk and how we got here and all that. So Renew Big Canoe website has uh, got a lot of information. Bruce Friedman, Lot 884. My understanding is if the community approves the two projects we vote on, it would be two dollar, roughly $2 more in our assessment. If the community did not approve those two, which are roughly $9 million, and the POA simply did the other maintenance projects, what would our assessments be? Good question. Hard question to answer, <laughs> standing right up here. Um, so I think the best way I could answer it is to say that the, the $15 million credit facility is not tied to any specific project here. So what does that mean? That means we could potentially use part of it to do a Choctaw golf course renovation if the other two projects are not voted yes. So it's, it's a little bit hard to say, you know, it would certainly be less because we wouldn't use the full loan. Um, but I think it's hard to say standing up here, you know, without some more specifics exactly, you know, how it would change things? I know that's not probably the answer you want. Less yeah. Than two, less than two. Probably less yeah. than two, yeah. Right, yeah, because the, um, the clubhouse and the postal facility are a significant part of that, so right. that yeah. alone would be less. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I got one over here. First of all, I just want to thank you all for the work you've done. I'm, I'm very excited about the project as, a, as someone who's ha had their own business. I don't understand all the confusion, but I would like to say that um, I think the POA board meeting, when you all 
made the decision to refinance the loan with Wells Fargo it was one of the best meetings I've ever heard. And if you all could put that, <laughs> if you all could re put that where people have access to that, I think it would be very helpful to understand how you all came to this decision to borrow the $15 million. Um, I, I just felt like from the very beginning, I had a clearer understanding of this. And I understand that, you know, it's, it's easy not to, to listen to the meeting. Sometimes you get busy and you don't do that. But I highly recommend going back and, and doing that. I'm Karen McClure. I love living here. <laughs> I'm so excited about how this is going to um, improve um, the facilities and all. And also, I, I truly believe it's going to increase our property values. And I thank you all very much. Thank you. <laughs> The, hang on just one second, Mark. Back. Yeah. The, the video from that meeting, it's January of 2022, and it's out on the website uh, under My Big Canoe um, POA meetings videos. But Mark, maybe you can link it, maybe you can link it directly within the Renew Big Canoe. Yeah, actually there is a link in the frequently asked questions to that meeting. Right. Uh, it is posted, right. so it's on there, but perhaps it would, uh, behoove us to make it more prominent. We can do that. We'll, uh, I am the webmaster, and so <laughs> just because you asked so sweetly, I am gonna. I'll put up a link within the videos section of the website uh, with that very meeting with a little bit of explanation. So uh, I can do that. All right. So we're here on the busiest row in this entire meeting. <laughs> Greg Dunlap, 8051. It's really clear that you guys have put an enormous amount of work out to get all of this information out here to us. I want to back up for half a second though to Scott's answer on the post off or on the uh, parking lot here at the clubhouse because I don't know that we had a time frame when those 50 additional spaces are going to get added and I don't know if it's in that 6.35 million. The other aspect of that is you mentioned that there's no change in the labor or in the facilities. What's the current seat count of the restaurant and bar? What's the future seat count for the restaurant and the bar? And how do you not see an addition of labor with the increase in seat count that you've proposed? I mean, the bar itself almost triples in size. So, um, Greg, there is no dining seat count change. So it's 150 to 150. Um, the bar does get longer, you're right. So uh, wouldn't that be a nice problem to have of needing to add, you know, a second bartender? We need to add, as Amy was telling me this morning, we need to add a second bartender right now. The problem is they fall over each other. There's, you know, you're trying to take cash in that room plus have two bartenders in that tiny little bar space. It just doesn't work. So. Um, from a waitress and kitchen standpoint, it's, it's 150 to 150. From a bartender standpoint, sure, we can, we can certainly add another bartender if we find out that, you know, we've got standing room only at the new bar as well. As far as the parking question, because you asked that too, um, the 50 um, space change, we have a, you know, a ballpark number for that, but I don't want to quote it because it hasn't gone through engineering work and it's not in that 6.35. Crawl, walk, run. So the idea again is we're moving the capacity over here. We're giving more meeting space over there. A lot of times the meetings and the dining don't co, you know, coexist on the same night. For example, you're not having a Ridge Runners meeting on a Friday night while you're filling all of this side with parking. But if we do find that we start doing more and more events and we're trying to do two things at once in the building, then we would have that plan. That would be separate money. That would be built into my ongoing capital budget that, that Bill talked about, and that would then be approved by the board as part of our annual operating plan. So it would not be a, a separate loan, a separate thing. It would be part of my ongoing capital budget if we need it or when we need it. I, I, I'd like it to be when we need it. All right, well, I'm standing right back here. We got one. Good morning, Kimberly LaHackler, lot 8107. First of all, thank you very much for 
your service to our community. I think you're doing a great job. My question, not to be a fly in the ointment, is when I'm considering the project scope, what I keep in the back of my mind is the future growth of Big Canoe. It's obvious after COVID, our full-time residency numbers have increased. Then we've got the noise of the developer putting in more residential lots. Blackwell Creek, or Village Creek, excuse me, Blackwell Village, excuse me, access to Big Canoe. And so what I look at is our other amenities, the existing pools, racket, and are we keeping our eye, as we're looking at these projects, are we keeping our eye at how long those existing amenities are going to serve the community well? Thank you. That is an excellent question. So um, on the long range planning horizon, so this was all the, the output of the long range planning committee and staff between 2023 and 2025. The next set of projects, because we said uh, on June 3rd, we said Renew Big Canoe is a journey. We've been on a Renew Big Canoe journey for the last three years. This is the next phase. There is another phase. And the other phase is we already know the marina parking has an issue. So the next big project is both safety and capacity for the marina is something we will be looking at. And we got a couple plans that are being designed and costed on that too. The fitness center is the next big one. So the fitness center is back up to about the same number of memberships we had in 2020, before COVID, 2019, before COVID. So we will be, as soon as we get moving on all of these, as far as detailed design and permitting and construction, we will need a group of uh, professionals to be coming in and looking at the fitness center. What is the role of the beach club? How do we solve the parking? What do we do about, you know, people have said indoor tracks, more room for equipment. All of those things will be looked at for the next phase. I think the fitness center is the next big jewel in the crown that we got to get after. And yeah, great, uh, Roger Hackler mentioned to me, Voice of the Community, the T4 survey that we did, which is where we got these uh, projects from, the next thing on the list gets into fitness center all right i'm a coming come on over here i'm gonna get that guy paul and then i'll come to you he can just hand it right on down hi uh, my name is john reese lot 3441 uh he has two things um you mentioned these additional projects does that mean that sometime during this 15-year period we're expecting to borrow more money and uh also there's Everything that's gone on here suggests that there shouldn't be any big canoe, renewed big canoe shouldn't result in any increase in, let's say, the golf course fees or the food and beverage costs like prices of the menu. So is that true? We wouldn't expect to see those things increase as a result of renewed big canoe. Thanks. So I'll do the second question first. So I didn't say that there wouldn't be any uh, normal increase for example we took when we did this year's budget we said if we're purchasing new golf carts for example for the golf amenity then the cart fees will increase so each amenity we're trying to look at more and more as a standalone business and if you know john gets a new fleet of pontoon boats there's going to be a commensurate increase in the fees that we as property owners might pay to to pay for those boats so we try to make just like a, a real business would do if you're making investments in that business you're going to look at all your pricing and revenue too so you know don't don't say oh well they'll never be that's just regardless of whether there were pretend there's no renew big canoe slide up here and if i was talking about the 2023 budget we'd be having the same thing of saying these are the investments we're making in each amenity and sometimes the either the guest fees go up or the membership fees go up or the greens fees go up or the cart fees go up those are things we look at all the time in addition to just normal assessment increases to keep up with inflation because the cost of sod, the cost of fertilizer, and the cost of labor are not getting cheaper. All right. So regarding your second question, Bill mentioned it. When you look at our cash flow, um, as we get beyond 2025, 2026, we have taken care of the biggest expenses with Petit Dam. Our cash flow gets much healthier 
much, much healthier. It's already good, it gets really good. So when we talk about things like, oh, fitness centers and things like that, you know, we have models that say, yes, we should be able to handle those kind of expenses without coming back and looking at a 15, another loan, another assessment or something. Bill didn't mention it, the original idea of, of this 15 million was to accelerate these projects. We had a plan that said someday we're gonna get to the clubhouse, someday we're gonna get to the post office, someday we gotta deal with Choctaw. And Bob White and the Finance Committee said, whoa, 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 we have an amazing opportunity, never gonna happen again to get 3.46% ever. Why don't we take that opportunity, we can accelerate those projects, not hurt our cash flow as we've showed you, and do them earlier and get through this period of time where we can actually do these things at this amazing interest rate. And then, yeah, our normal cash flow will take care of the other things that we're talking about. So hopefully that helps. Yeah, Paul Goldstein, 2231. I just want to comment on the gentleman's uh, skepticism about the $2. You know, you have to bear in mind, and I was skeptical at first too, but you know, the $2 is based on the fact there are going to be more lot owners and property owners uh, dwelling, you know, homeowners in Big Canoe uh, when this loan is converted to permanent finance. And I think the assumption, wasn't the assumption there would be 3,200 lot owners and, prop and homeowners? You did Actually, not? none of that's in that math. But is that, what, what's so. the projected population of Big Canoe then? I mean, won't there be more people contributing to the uh, operating assessments and the uh, capital? So. so if I understand your question, um, this is kind of what I would call a steady state situation, um, with the one exception being maybe the capital contribution fee, although there is a certain assumption, and Jane knows what that is, I don't have it off the top of my head, of how many um, sales per year drives the capital contribution fee. Yeah, so the assumption is that 250 properties change hands and generate capital contribution fees every year. We haven't moved that number up. We haven't moved that number down. It's based on kind of a historical average. Um, as, as I said before, this is kind of current plus projected. Um, the 4.2 million in income before depreciation is based on what I said in one of my earlier slides about how historically we've generated that every year. Now, full transparency, some of that comes because assessment, the general assessments have increased some, uh, but most of those have been to offset cost. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a steady state is what I would call it. Yeah, and actually the two dollars. I mean, yeah. A, yeah. Amy knows the formula better than I do, so I'll let I'll let her right. explain. Right. I mean, you can you can you can take the actual number of lots and number of homes right now and extrapolate it out. But we use the, a denominator of about thirty-one ninety to do the rough estimate. So at that at that average, because lots don't pay the same as homes, it's really only like a buck twenty-eight. <laughs> It's not, we just, we just rounded it up to $2 to be very conservative and it's a number people can remember and, and, and lots are even much less. Christine Sheriffs, um, my question is you show all these projects at 15 million. Okay, how did you get to that specific 6.35? And how did you get to 3.4? Because what did we pay to do Creek? Yeah. Is it not on? Nope. A lot less. <laughs> A lot less. Go zip, zip over for me to that um, tiered slide. So, uh, yep. Great. No. Actually, we're not up to, no. So, so remember, on the loan that Bill talked about refinancing, we are paying the principal, as he said. So basically, we will never be more than 15 million because every year we're paying about a million dollars worth of principal. So we're actually adding to our line of credit draw capability by about a million a year. So we will always end up at 15. It's not 15 plus 4.8. As far as these things, let's go through these real quick. So. Clubhouse renovation, 
Um, normally an architect, uh, Joe Thompson is a, a lifelong architect, lives here, brilliant man, uh, head of the Long Range Planning Committee. Um, Joe said normally in his practice all these years, an architect will normally charge about 5% on the anticipated cost of the building to do all their design work, permitting work, you know, detailed drawings, et cetera. So we went out to, we actually asked for about six people to bid. We got three that were willing to come here and do it. One of those was Quo Dietrich and Chi that actually Regis helped find for us, um, award-winning guy. Hopefully you watched the, the presentation he did a couple um, weeks ago, but anyway, um, he was the only one willing to give us a fixed fee, which was also handy. So he said to finish the clubhouse for you is going to be about 300000 of architect's fees. The board said we don't want to spend 300000 because property owners have to vote on this project. We don't want to spend three hundred. and say, ah, no, we don't want to do that. So we went to JC and we said, can we cap it? What, what number would work for you to get us to the point where we would have good drawings, we could go out to a general contractor, we could come in with electricians, uh, HVAC guys, whatever, and get a good number to take to a vote? He said, give me $100,000. We signed a contract for that, and for the last year we've worked with JC. We now have a drawing package that's about 50 pages. So he's had a general contractor go through that, plus his own estimates, plus subs that we've brought in here to look at the HVAC electrical and things. So is there more design left to do? So some of the things you see on Facebook where, you know, uh, should we add a lift to deal with the handicapped accessibility or how high does this wall need to be for the health department and things, all of that would normally happen in the next two thirds of the design phase. But the one third of the design phase we've done gets us pretty darn close to knowing what we're going to have to rip apart, what HVAC we can save, what plumbing changes we need to make, where the electrical things need to change, we're changing the generator capacity, all that stuff is in that 6.35. So we feel pretty good about this. Um, it's not just a, a swag and we could be off by a factor of two. Um, Choctaw came from architect Bill Bergen and Bill has been, uh, obviously did Creek for us, that was about a $2.3 million renovation on Creek. Everything in the last two years, inflation-wise, has skyrocketed. So the cost of labor um, to do all the digging and stuff they're gonna have to do is hugely increased. Cost of pipes, cost of sod, cost of fertilizer, everything is dramatic. So that's coming from the architect who is basically, we're now going out to bid on Creek. Um, but Bill feels that's a pretty close number. He's got it, break it broken down, how, how much sod, how much shaping, how much fertilizer. Um, he was pretty darn close on the creek estimate by the time we went out and bid it. He's probably pretty close on that one too. So I would feel pretty good about that number. The postal service uh, facility, that is based on a new building, which is sometimes easier because J.C. Chi then was able to take a, a look at the, the schematic that he created and said, how many square feet is it? How much, you know, how much space, how much lighting, how much heat, all of that kind of thing. And then we had two civil engineers actually design and bid on the parking changes required. So that 2.7, even though we haven't taken the building to the same level of design that we've done here, it, it's, it's pretty good on a square foot basis. We're not gonna be off by a factor of two on that either. And then admin building is one that uh, we had gotten pretty far with the chimneys design way back when. So we had gone through that building with a fine tooth comb. We're repurposing that building now into an admin space, so we're leveraging all that work and all those estimates that have been done. Uh, plus, we know what our insurance settlement is now, so we know how much we're getting on that. So um, these are not made up numbers. There's been a whole lot of work that goes into them. I get this all the time on Ask the POA, though. Scott, what happens if, what happens if that number comes in as, at seven? Is the board just gonna go spend that? And the answer is no, we don't work that way. If it comes in at, at seven million, the first thing we do is we sit down with all the stakeholders, design team, we say, okay, well maybe we can't do this thing, or what if we take this out, or we do value engineering. And we do everything we can to bring it back as close as we possibly can you know, to that number. 
And if for whatever reason we can't get there, and we, this is kind of what happened on the chimneys a few years ago, we can defer a project. We're not going to go just spend, as Bill talked about, we have a very, very, very detailed cash flow model that we beat up like crazy. Jane and I go through it probably every week. With finance, we go through it probably every two months. With the board, we go through it once a quarter. So these numbers can't change that much because then we'd be violating our own cash flow. So we will, uh, we will fight to get them as close to these as we possibly can. And if for any reason something needed to be moved or changed or whatever, the board would come back to the community and talk about that. Uh, if, if I could add a couple of comments. Um, by the way, I love all these questions, okay? okay? One thing we have not really talked about very much with the clubhouse renovation, how many of you remember December 25th last year? A lot of power was lost. People uh, didn't have heat and water in their homes. Well, we had to put a few of them up in the lodge, okay? And the lodge is not set up, you know, to house people in a safer place than they would be in their home. As part of this, additional and larger generators are going to be um, incorporated in this plan so that the clubhouse will become a safe haven, safer haven, uh, than what people would have at their home, which is a huge benefit, by the way. It'll be set up and we'll have the proper equipment, cots, blankets, in storage at the uh, Public Safety Department uh, should we need to uh, utilize the facility for that. And that's something we is not talked about, but it, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. Thank you. Okay. Excuse me. Uh, Steve Dusler, 2031. Uh, question. Am I correct in assuming that for the post office rebuild that the egress is one way in and one way out? And if so, yeah. has any kind of study been done as to what to expect there So in traffic? It, it was impossible for any reasonable amount of money to turn uh, that parking lot into a circular or, or in, you know, basically one way kind of parking lot. So what is in the money I was talking about is a retaining wall that goes out a little bit into the, the fall off to make the entrance area that's so miserable right now, that terrible turn you come out of, my car bottoms out there all the time. Um, basically change all that, um, get us more space over by the loading dock area. The design plan is to move that dock back even further now than the pictures I've been showing. Um, so it can actually act as a retaining wall for the upper parking lot that will open up more space in that area. Um, as you get further towards the, the uh, chimneys building though, um, it does get a little tighter, but not any tighter honestly than what you would find at IGA or what you'd find at Costco or anything else. So basically, you know, the civil engineering guys have looked at it and, the, you know, it would be back to back parking, especially as you get down a little further, but it's not any different than you, we do every day in a shopping center. So that, that is the best we can do without huge amounts of earth moving and big retaining walls. Yep. Yeah. It's a disaster now, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The good news is at least it'll be flat and you'll be able to see and you won't be dodging postal trucks. So three, three positives, but no, you're right. I mean, uh, we did traffic studies, so we actually put out uh, traffic monitoring at the post office and looked and there are definitely a few times a day, right, for short periods of time where it gets it gets tight and certainly for Christmas it gets definitely crazy so w the judgment of the committee was this is way better on a normal day in day out basis you, it's kind of like building a church you don't design the church for Christmas Eve because then not you're building a huge empty church a little bit of the same thing so it, it's the best we can do with the facility we live in the mountains it's really tough Yep. Joe Fogel, 6027. 
Scott, uh, there hasn't been anything discussed about the lower level of the clubhouse. What are the future plans for renovation of the lower level? Yeah, great, great question. So we, we didn't spend that much time on the lower level um, because it wasn't, it's not really a property owner space problem, it's a staff problem. So, you know, right now we have this beautiful pro shop. It's huge, right? We've got all kinds of merchandise in there. We've got great locker rooms that are kind of built for a different time and day, honestly, like when people used to use locker rooms that way. Um, unfortunately, what that means is we have very little office space in this building. So, you know, if you look at your banquet staff, they're kind of shoehorned into the corners over there. If you look at Poor Alley, if you go down all the way to the end of the hall, we've taken over, you know, the golf pro's office and we got racks and racks of merchandise and things like that. So um, there was a plan done to, to sketch up how would we increase storage space. This building is desperate for storage space. And to do that would change, you know, shrink the pro shop, shrink the locker rooms, all that kind of stuff. Um, that is a not even contemplated yet future phase of the clubhouse. It's not gonna happen anytime soon. Um, we think with the renovation of the admin building that we can move a lot of the merchandise that Ali has over to the basement of the admin building, uh, the part that really got flooded, and that that's kind of good because she's putting the merchandise everywhere. It's over at the marina, it's over at the tennis center, it's, it's everywhere, so have it centrally located anyway. That will free up some more space for storage, and someday, far, far, far in the future, we might look at doing something downstairs, but nothing contemplated, no schedule, no budget. Yeah, and if I could just emphasize that point, there are no secret plans being developed by the board or anybody else to do something downstairs. Zero. Why did you bring that up, Terry? <laughs> I don't know. Who, who would think that we, that, I don't know. God, who knows? Well, we just have an incredible number of questions. So I'm, I'm going to be focusing on anybody that hasn't asked one yet, and then I'm going to circle around. How are we doing on time, by the way? I'm here all day. Okay. So we got plenty of time here, so, so, uh, and these are some good questions. So since this lady is closest to me, she gets the microphone. Hello, Barbara Hall, 440. Um, how many construction crews are going to be working on this? Is it one company? Which project is first? And what control does the POA have over meetings, deadlines, or, you know, extending over projected time frames? Because we're in a weird place in history where nobody wants to work, nobody wants to show up. Well, they'll show up and they'll get the first check, but they won't stay to completion. So where are we at with that? So, so most of those questions asked me about a month after the vote. Okay. Because honestly, we haven't spent much time yet uh, with an implementation plan because again, that gets into general contractor time and selection and a bidding process. We will go through a bidding process. My strong desire would be to have one really strong GC. Um, we will build into, if this passes, uh, we will uh, add a project manager to my staff because we have about three years of really big projects here. Um, something that we had built into this year's budget and we decided to hold off on until we found out what the will of the property owners are. Um, but, but clearly having one GC would be great because then you could basically, they could mobilize once, we can save a bunch of money, they can move their subs back and forth. Let's say they start on the post office first and then the electricians come over here and the concrete guys over there and then the concrete guys over here, we would save a bunch. So that'd be my preference, but we haven't gotten farther than that. It, there will be a bidding process we go through to select the GC. All and, right. and details of contract negotiation, that's where your leverage comes in for yep. making people yep. finish on time. Lee Arthur's 153 Swallow Point. I never thought of this until right now. If and when we build a new postal facility, what do we do with the existing building? Um, that is a great question. One of the things that um, Long Range Planning wanted to do was not necessarily uh, use up all of our options right away. So it's okay, as our architect says, it's okay to have a building that for a little while you're not sure what to do with until you sort of see how the new campus works out. 
One potential idea that has been kicked around is to put Trina in that area because the parking's nutty in that area, so it's okay for trucks with trailers and stuff to pull in there. Sending new property owners to make their selections to a place that's located behind our dump doesn't necessarily uh, have the right brand essence to me <laughs> for Big Canoe. And if you go into Trina's office now, she has boxes of, of color chips and architectural samples. It, it's nutty that we're kind of operating out of there. So that's one example, but no firm plans. Hi, Stacy Johnson again. I want to repeat what so many people have he here have said and in the community. Thank you again for the amount of work, a huge amount of work and talent. A lot of thought has gone into this. That being said, what thought went into the use of the old soccer field where we had the Oktoberfest? Certain buildings could be built there that could address some of the parking issues we have at the postal facility, at the fitness center. I, I'm positive it's been looked at. I'm wondering what that was. So, so w way back, probably two years ago, Long Range Planning was looking at probably three potential places for a new post office. One is soccer field. Second was trying to shoehorn it in uh, between the tennis center and, um, and the fire station. And the third was village core. Um, we were so successful with the package porch that and they believed, after talking to lots of people, looking at options, looking at construction costs, they felt the post office be should belong centrally located to Big Canoe, and it should be placed in the village core, and with the adjacency of the package porch, they felt that that was the best decision compared to uh, using up our, our facilities for, you know, the soccer field and, yeah, and building all new roads and new plumbing. And by the way, the soccer field has a, a, a um, conservation easement associated with it. For us to put buildings on that then violates that easement and then we have to go and give up other land and trade with the Georgia Land Trust and stuff like that. So that got a little dicey too. The, the cost of building it behind the um, fire station. One of the reasons the fire station cost was so high was just because everything is like this. And so their ingress, egress building there also was bad. So they felt that uh, Village Core is the right place to put it. It's me again. <coughs> Scott, just a quick comment on your previous answer to my question about whether we looked at took a good hard look at alternatives based on the fact that you said, well, in 2020, this costs this much, and it might be like the tennis center and the T4. So I, I'm assuming the answer is no, we did not take a good, hard, honest to gosh look at what it might cost to do not a Band-Aid, but a, uh, a revitalization of that facility to make it usable for the next 10 or years or so. So I, I will assume the answer is a no. Now my question is, uh, we talked, uh, a couple of questions were about the uh, fitness center, or wellness center, excuse me, and marina uh, parking. Two projects near and dear to a lot of property owners' hearts. One that I really think, or both of them, uh, would really ex uh, enhance the property owner experience. How far down the road are those? And if, in fact, we choose not to spend so much money on for example, a post office, could those be accelerated? Right. So marina parking, um, there are currently two different designs um, that have both been done by an engineering company. Uh, Lydell, our director of operations, is working through the bids on uh, both of those designs so we can see what range of costs we're talking about. There's been numbers flying around here as long as I've been here about what it would cost to fix the marina we need to get some hard numbers. So that one is, I've got paper designs, I don't have solid quotes. So that one's moving ahead. Uh, fitness center, nothing, nothing substantial yet. The thing that has to happen on fitness center is exactly what you were able to do on, on Clubhouse. We need to find the right professional team 
to come in and who understands fitness, where it's going, what kind of equipment is necessary, what other competitive, uh, you know, uh, communities are doing, et cetera, and they need to build a plan for us. And they need to start looking at the parking, the role of the beach club, the, you know, what needs to happen to the fitness center. That one hasn't even started yet. So the master plan uh, that they rolled out, the committee rolled out, was to focus on 2023 through 2025. So right now, both of these projects are beyond 2025. And could they be accelerated? That would be a board decision. Mm -hmm. Hi, Don Bunker, 2634. Just, just, just let me make one more comment that, that uh, dovetails into what Regis and Scott were talking about. I mean, I think it's feasible that were the postal facility not to receive a yes vote, that that would free up some of this $15 million, that if the board, you know, had enough information and felt like it, you know, the, it was something that the property owners uh, would want, and if it didn't fall within the scope of needing a property owner vote, I mean, there's no reason we couldn't use loan funds to do that. Yeah. Sorry. Hi, Don Bunker, 2634. Choctaw um, is irrigation and drainage, correct? It's not like a renovation like Creek where we're going to build new greens and go from par 36 to par 35. It's basically upgrade the infrastructure. Is that correct? The uh, 3.4 there is all infrastructure, so it is exactly that. It's drainage and, um, and it is irrigation. The question that we're getting billed to bid on is while we're ripping up, because to, to put irrigation and drainage in a T complex, for example, you're, you're ripping up that whole area. So while you're ripping it up, do we also build a forward T or back T so we can have a 5T system like we have on Creek? And the master plan for golf at, at Big Canoe was to have a 5T system everywhere. So we will have a separate cost number for those enhancements and the, the board will decide whether that, is, that small increment is, is necessary. And again, we gotta, before we talk about that though, we gotta validate that 3.4 for the irrigation and drainage, which is the maintenance part of Choctaw. So the enhancements are not part of that? They are not, they are not. But the enhancements would be, if you, yeah. look, if you look at Creek, yeah. the enhancements represented about 250,000 and they were much more extensive than what is being contemplated for Choctaw. And one, and one thing uh, I could mention, because I'm kind of familiar, you mentioned greens, and as part of the irrigation and drainage, the green surfaces will be replaced because the drainage and irrigation underneath those surfaces will be replaced. Hi, Cynthia Hamann, uh, I'm trying to think, 3524. Um, my, I want to thank everybody also. I can't believe how much work y'all have done and all volunteering on all of this. I'm super excited about the postal facility because um, lots of reasons, but the building is ancient. I think 30 plus years old. The parking's horrible. I've fallen before. The stairs going, if you have to park on the lower side, are horrible. I've always thought, I can't believe this is all we can do. And I mean, we're all gonna, gonna get older. I wanna be here for 30 years. I use Amazon a lot, online shopping. I, I'm not a big go out and shop or I'd live closer to shopping. So I'm super excited about it. And I do feel, that's, you're right, my husband would say otherwise. But um, I'm, just, I'm just so excited about the post office. And was that the number one project or the number two project? Weren't, I get the clubhouse and the postal backwards if you could just tell me which one. But aren't those like our most two most important things that we all like voted on a few years ago. So I'm just really excited about Post, that. And postal was number two. Postal number two. was I number two. I thought it should be number one. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, 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 it's a great point because I'm, so, yeah. No, 
some, sometimes we lose this, this thread and we have to remember that this plan came from us, right? We, we didn't, it wasn't a separate committee made this up. This was all based on the whole strategic plan survey that was done two years ago, and it said, deal with the dump, deal with the post office, and improve the clubhouse. So one, two, three, right? That's and what we're doing. And your car was not the one. <laughs> yeah, no. Very good. I'm glad. That's good. So, so clubhouse was the number one amenity. I don't really think of trash and postal as an amenity. Hi, Cheryl Dunlap again. I have two questions. First of all, I read in the eblast this week that we have just recently purchased 600 pieces of new furniture for the clubhouse. I've heard anecdotally that it cost about $450,000. I would like to think that we are not going to be purchasing yet again new furniture in this renovation because that's just throwing money down the drain. So I hope That'd you can address silly, that. That'd be silly, wouldn't it? Very much so. Yeah. And my no. second question, there have been references from the architect, from Scott, from several of these presentations that a renovation of our clubhouse, like what we're looking at, usually generates more income, which is great. I don't think it's a secret that our clubhouse as an amenity loses money every year. Has any pro forma been done at all to try to project what we anticipate would be additional income to our clubhouse as a result of this renovation to help offset that loss, those losses that we continue to experience. Thank you. So we could do a whole separate meeting on, on the clubhouse and the clubhouse financials and how Big Canoe operates the clubhouse and the mission statement that um, Bill was talking about, you know, all of those things. but. Um, no is the short answer. We did not want to uh, build a case for property owners saying, oh, trust me, you know, we don't have any data or anything, but, you know, trust me, it's going to be good. We're going to, like, uh, double the bar revenue, and we're going to 30% increase and all that, because why would you believe it? So, no, we didn't do that. So, basically, this is all expense and exactly what you said, increased dining and increased bar tab and everything, and uh, which should hopefully come tighter connection with the golf amenity right behind me that is all icing on the cake we didn't build it in um, second question was the uh, architect uh, his interior design team is the same designer we worked with to buy the furniture so she very much knew the direction we were going and he was going and so uh, everything we've bought is usable and planned to be used in the new floor plans and everything, we would not go out and need to. There, there will be obviously more, you know, new curtains because those probably date to 19 something. <laughs> They're old. Um, anyway, um, there'll, be, there'll be new stuff. Obviously, we can't wait for these chairs. I'm like, these are horrid, right? But no, we won't have to go out and buy all new furniture. Yeah. And starting next Wednesday, that new furniture will be here okay. and installed. Thank the Lord. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, in the hallway. Yep, yep. They are indeed. Anything else? This yes. has been great. This is One awesome. More. Yes, go ahead. So Kim Bunker, I think it's all beautiful. You have done a great job. I think we have to have a firm understanding of the finances to make it happen. Just like any other household, you have to know the numbers, right? So our loan that was supposedly paid off for a lower interest rate, we're now paying six point. Two five percent is that correct? And w that's on four point eight million. Yeah. That's what I need to understand. So, it started at four point eight million when we paid the, the old loan off. We've been continuing to pay principal on that loan monthly at round numbers between ninety and a hundred thousand dollars a month. So we're a year in. So the value of that loan now is probably I think around three point seven, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so we're paying the higher interest rate on 3.7, and then every month as it goes down, we're paying the higher interest rate on a lower balance. Right, and we're still exposed to the Fed and raising interest rates. Can you speak up just a little bit? I'm sorry. We're still exposed to the Fed raising interest rates over Correct. the next couple of years? We, right now so we are. So that interest is going to tick up? Well, I mean, the, we looked at a forecast when we did the 2023 budget, and as I was saying earlier, I mean, even when we did the loan, and the board approved the loan, you know, 
we were fully transparent at that point and said, we expect that the Federal Reserve is gonna raise interest rates, okay? We expected maybe it would go like that, and it went like that, right? It, so it's these things that put a kink in all plans, right? Even the best laid intentions. Well, sure. I mean, so if, if, if we had perfect knowledge of everything we wanted to do, yeah. we'd all be multimillionaires. Well, it does. <laughs> I mean, you it, know. what it does, the interest takes away from the loan cash availability, right? Because as your interest goes up, they charge the loan, right? Because no, we it, don't have access no, to no, it until no, no. May. No, so, so we pay principal in cash every month. Right. And we pay interest in cash every month. So the only thing that's happening to the loan balance is it's going down every month right. by it about Right, it doesn't go over 000. 15 million, I got that. But the interest rate still ticks up no. on a monthly basis. No. Not the interest rate. No. So Until May 2025. So, so hang on, you, you, so you're absolutely correct in one respect in that the interest rate will float Thank you. from now okay. and from from until May of 20 2022 yeah. when we started, okay, until May of 2025. So two more okay. years. So of yes, you yeah. are correct in that respect that the rate will float. What none of us know is what's gonna happen to the rate, right? All we can rely upon is forecasts from our lenders and forecasts that we see independently that give us a feeling for what they think is gonna happen. If if you read the Fed minutes, if you read what most uh, economists are talking about, they're saying there is a likelihood that in 2023, we may see two more increases in 2023. And the, the forecast is that each one of those would be a quarter of a percent or 25 basis points as they, as they call it. From that point, the expectation is that the rate is gonna flatten and then at some point thereafter actually start to decline once again. So for us, what that means is, until it flattens and, and starts to go down, you're right, we could see a couple of more increases between now and the end of the year. And then it's likely that it will flatten out in 2024 and maybe even come down some in the second half or so of 2024. It's a hope. Yeah. It's a hope. Absolutely. So it, it's just... And, and so just let me make the point, issue. let me make the point I've made earlier, okay? This wasn't a finance committee decision. This wasn't a management decision. This was a board decision. And someone alluded to earlier about the board presentation where, where I, as the, as the person who was in charge of that subcommittee, we made an extensive presentation to the board in terms of why did we choose to look for money? What was the process that we went through to bid <coughs> and look for money? How did we come to a point that we were recommending you know, a certain path for the board, and then the board ultimately decided it was a prudent decision to make? So it, it, it almost doesn't matter. It almost doesn't matter what happens with the interest rate because it's for such a short period of time that you are then you are then getting access to fifth, the full 15 million at 3.46. We can put it in the bank. We could take all that money and put it in the bank if we wanted to, because we're only paying 3.46. We can invest and make even more money. So the, you're getting kind of hung up on the interest rate thing, and that's only for a couple years, and it doesn't really affect the opportunity associated with the loan. Yeah, and the other thing I would mention, and we haven't talked about it at all, I did mention that we're sitting on about $8 million in cash, okay? With interest rates where they are, we're earning more on our cash as well. So there's a partial offset, if you will, to paying a higher rate on the loan is we're earning more on our cash every month <coughs> as well. And to put it in Terry terms, there's a, <laughs> there's a little bit of short-term pain for much more long-term gain. That's, that's what it boils down to. 
I like, ter I like Terry terms. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have one simple question, Mike Volk. Uh, if this is approved, what is our mobilization date? Mike, that was, that was kind of the question I said before is ask me about a month after the approval um, because we haven't met with GCs yet. We have to go through a bidding process per policy and procedure 152 um, to select the GC. The GC then will have to tell us how fast they can get here and mobilize and things like that. My goal, personal goal, would be to actually be able to start the clubhouse in February next year. Perfect. Bob Adams, 1044. Uh, Scott, you, you mentioned that we're taking this loan and we're accelerating renovations that we couldn't do without that. And I can see the postal facility and the clubhouse making my life better. Why are we borrowing money for Choctaw when it's not gonna make all of our lives better? Creek was used, we renovated Creek with proceeds. Why are we borrowing this money? So Choctaw is in the same desperate need for help that Creek was. So underground, um, as you've probably seen in some of the, the things Lydell has shown, all that corrugated metal pipe is just as rotten under, Creek, uh, under Choctaw as it was under Creek. Um, same thing with the irrigation system. The irrigation system doesn't work the ha half the time, is very wasteful. You can't do precise control like they can on Creek. So again, it was a case of we will continue to limp along with Choctaw, digging up fairways when drainage fails, digging up irrigation when it fails, causing disturbance to the golf amenity. Um, we would have had to limp and limp and limp along for a while on Choctaw and this enables this influx of 3.46% cash, lets us move that forward and get things, it's deferred maintenance, honestly. I mean, it's part of the whole big, you know, we're, we're catching up on the roads, the bridges, the dams, this extra 15 million let us catch up on some of the non-sexy things like Choctaw and the post office, all things that have been deferred here a long time. It's, it's in the cash flow, Cherokee's the, Cherokee is the newest course, so it's in the best shape of the three. So in our 10-year model, we have Cherokee factored in, and we will have the money for it, just like Bill said, as we roll off of the dam, there will be free cash available for us to then apply to Cherokee. You're right, we've got one more nine to do after this one. But to your point, if without this influx of cash, Choctaw then would have been in that spot. And Cherokee would have had to go even longer and we're just kicking the can down the road over and over and over again. So for a for dollar 27 a month, I, I, I think it's a, a good plan to let us catch up. We're, we're catching up. <laughs> All right. What a what a fabulous session! Uh, we're starting to lose our audience. I think people are getting hungry now, or maybe or maybe some are getting hangry. But uh, nonetheless, this has been great. I think we're about close to wrapping it up now. I'm just going to make one comment really quick. Uh, myself, I've been hearing everybody else's great questions, but kind of from a board perspective, I think that we look at renew big canoe this journey is a journey of continuous improvement. Everybody has their particular thing that they want done. We have to look at everything, and at some point in time, a lot of these things have been kicked down the road for a long, long time. So we had to use something to make a decision to do something. So the Voice of the Community Survey showed us some things, and at the end of the day, this is what we have come up with using our best information and what we feel like is the wisest implementation. And so if your particular pet project is not in phase one, we apologize, but we got to do something because it's continual improvement. We just want to make this place as good as it can be. We look at the palette that we have to work with here, this incredible neighborhood, the incredible people, so uh, we appreciate it, and uh, 
Uh, we hope that everybody will continue to be engaged, and when the time comes, that you will use your opportunity and vote. Thanks, everybody.